To tell you the truth, I'm scared. Scared about what's happening to our planet. 2016 was recently named the hottest year on record, making it the third consecutive year to set a temperature record. Global warming is more of a problem than it's ever been before. The more hottest years on record we have, the more we'll be threatened like things, by things like rising sea levels and extreme weather events. But I'm sure you've heard all that before. That's old news. But as some new news, we are taking a step in the right direction. Last year in Paris, 195 nations agreed to cut their carbon emissions, showing that world leaders really do recognize it the dangers associated with global warming. And I think it's great that we're taking collective action, but there is a problem. Earlier this year, the United States government indicated that they want to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Now, the United States is the world's second largest greenhouse gas emitter. Every year, we release around 6.6 .6 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalents into the air. That's 18 times as much as the weight of corn we produce every year. We produce a lot of corn. I know you all know that. <laughs> and so continuing with these astonishing emissions rates will have long-lasting and perhaps irreversible consequences. So the question becomes, we're forced to ask ourselves, what if we do get to a point where global warming is getting out of control? With the recent climate change denial and inaction in the US government, now may be the time to address the science and morality behind new solutions to global warming. And for the past couple years, I've been studying one of these solution ideas. It's something called geoengineering, which sounds complicated, but it's really just an umbrella term for things and methods to, on a large scale, cool the climate as a response to global warming. Now, there are multiple ways you could go about doing this large scale cooling, but the one that I've focused on is an idea called marine cloud brightening. So to explain marine cloud brightening, I'm gonna give a quick crash course on clouds. Who, who out there has seen a cloud before? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I expected that. I mean, everyone knows what a cloud is, right? But actually, what, what the heck are clouds? Well, they're really just collections of many tiny water droplets and sometimes ice crystals. And when sunlight hits these water droplets, they let some of it through, but they also reflect some back up into space. And the clouds act kind of like big, soggy mirrors. And that's why stormy clouds, for example, look so dark from below. They're so thick that they're reflecting away almost all the sunlight that hits them. As you probably know from walking here today in good old Providence, when clouds block sunlight, it can get cold. So what if you could make clouds more reflective? Well, then the Earth's surface would cool down even more. And that's exactly the goal behind marine cloud brightening. You make the clouds over the oceans more reflective, which would help to lower the planet's temperature. So how do you make clouds more reflective? Well, you do that by increasing the number of those droplets in the cloud. And the proposed way of doing that would be to take these funny looking vessels, which are actually quite amazing feats of engineering, out into the ocean, where they'd spray a fine mist of seawater into the air. And as this mist rises, it would come into contact and mix with a type of low-level cloud that covers 20% of the Earth's oceans, called marine stratocumulus. And so when the salt crystals that were in this salty seawater, when they come into contact with these clouds, they become what we call cloud condensation nuclei. They actually help water condense into more droplets. These more droplets are better at reflecting sunlight, making the cloud quote unquote brighter. There you have it, marine cloud brightening, making clouds over the ocean more reflective. And the interesting thing is that modeling has actually shown that if you can brighten enough of these clouds, which you can with a network theoretically of, of those vessels and for a reasonable price, you could completely counteract the warming that would be caused by doubling today's levels of CO2. Now, I've just given you a lot to chew on. Is, is everyone still awake? Um, let's take a step away from the cloud physics for a bit. Basically, I'm telling you that there's a way to hack the planet 
to lessen the effects of global warming. Now, some of you out there are probably like, that's an interesting idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you were like, mm, this guy is crazy. Building machines to control the climate sounds like a really, really bad idea. You know, I've seen the, the YouTube comments on the other TED geoengineering videos, and they're really not pretty. But, you know, I, I do get it. I mean, geoengineering seems like a counterintuitive thing to be suggesting. Why on earth would we want to meddle more with the climate? We're obviously really bad at doing that. Isn't that what got us into this mess in the first place? But let me be clear. I'm not saying we should go out right now and dump a bunch of salt water into the air. For one thing, we need to do a lot more work to assess what kind of consequences that might have. But right now, I'd like to focus less on the specifics of those physical consequences and more on whether we, as humans, have the moral right to intentionally modify the Earth's climate. The man who invented the idea of marine cloud brightening, his name is Dr. John Latham, um, he used to be my research supervisor. And he once told me that with this whole geoengineering thing, we're essentially playing God. And that's really not something to take lightly. And I feel like the phrase playing God gets thrown around a lot nowadays in science, but people don't ever really stop to think about what that entails. You know, as humans, we have the ability to modify something as large and as complex as the Earth's climate. You know, with global warming already, we're starting to see unprecedented changes in weather and climate everywhere, not just limited to a specific area. With geoengineering, we're talking about making these kinds, these scale of changes intentionally. So it sort of seems like we've come to the point where our actions might not just be human in scale anymore. They may, might be somewhere closer to godlike. And then the question becomes, how do we use this power? We're here today to talk about breaking barriers. So how do we break the barrier, or do we break the barrier between acting like mere mortals and acting like gods? And I've struggled a lot with this question. You know, at the beginning I mentioned that the idea of global warming has always scared me, but in the middle of high school, when I became introduced to this idea of geoengineering, started working with Dr. Latham, and my friend Nick out there, I was like, wow, you know, this actually might be a solvable problem. You know, we can fix this. But the more I've looked at the sheer numbers of how much carbon we're emitting and the research that's out there, the less sure I've become that this is something we want to put ourselves in the position of having to do. So I don't claim to have the answer, but to help you think about it, I'll present two arguments in favor of geoengineering and one against it. The first justification for geoengineering looks something like this. We should geoengineer so we can optimize the climate for human activity. Now, I'm an engineering student, so in my limited experience, I found that the point of engineering is designing or improving something for human benefit. And so with this climate engineering thing, we can cool the planet, sure, but like, why not increase rainfall to help grow our crops or make certain regions more temperate and comfortable to live in? But while it might be tempting to turn the entire world into Palm Springs, <laughs> we need to keep in mind that if we approach geoengineering with this mindset, we're implying that the Earth is just another thing that humans have the right to dominate. And while we may act like gods, we must remember that our power is bounded by our limitations, our arrogance, and the gaps in our understanding, among other things. So as a response to the last argument, here's a compelling reason not to geoengineer. We should not geoengineer because nature is complicated, it's powerful, and we've messed with it enough in the first place. Attempting geoengineering isn't worth dealing with the repercussions it would cause. So real quick, if we, um, if we take a look at our track record of modifying the climate, let's see, we've caused global warming, and that's it? I know that was technically unintentional, but it just goes to show how bad we can be at predicting the consequences of our actions. And truthfully, with geoengineering, we don't yet know enough about it to actually go out and try it. But then there's the problem of politics. So say one day we do decide to go out and try geoengineering. Well, then who would be responsible for actually doing it? 
you know, the changes brought on by geoengineering would affect literally the entire world. And we don't have a governing body or an organization that represents the entire world's interests. A common problem that comes up when talking about this stuff is who sets the thermostat? What if one country wants the temperature here and another wants it somewhere else? Finally, the last argument for geoengineering sort of combines the previous two. Okay, okay, so I get that we shouldn't be meddling with nature because it's probably smarter than we are, and we shouldn't be taking up the mantle of God, but don't we have the moral obligation to protect and fix the problems we've created with global warming? And this argument keeps in mind that geoengineering does have limitations. You know, it might even be the lesser of two evils, something we'd only want to do if absolutely necessary. But it also keeps in mind that as humans, we have a moral responsibility to preserve the property, the rights, the general well-being of our species. As a friend of mine once put it, what property is more common than air, and what right more fundamental than breathing free? We have the moral obligation to preserve our environment, our Earth, even if it means dealing with the consequences of geoengineering. All right, so what are these arguments saying? What do we want? Well, we want a climate that is habitable and conducive to human activity. We don't want to meddle with the climate more than we already have, but we want to create a future, we need to create a future, where the well-being of humans, and therefore of the Earth we call home, is secure. And if we take a look at these, things that we want, the solution starts to become clearer. We need to do what we set out to do with the Paris Agreement. We need to slow down our emissions and mitigate our output of carbon. Think about it. Developing and implementing renewable energy technology will help spur the advancement of industry. You know, it'll grow our economies, give back to our societies, but it'll also help us work toward a more habitable planet, both for us and all the living things that share it. But you know, where, where does that leave us? I mean, we obviously have trouble following agreements like Paris, and that's what's so scary. And maybe I've even scared you a little bit today. But there is still reason to have hope, because we might not yet be at that point of no return, that point where we might need to geoengineer just to survive. And there are things everyone in this room can do to help. Turn off the lights, or at least buy a better bulb. Vote with your dollar. Plant a tree. And most importantly, get out there and shout. Encourage the people around you to take action as well. I'm not kidding. These things really do add up. I'd like to leave you with a quote by Henry David Thoreau. He says, I love nature partly because she is not man, but a retreat from him. None of his institutions control or pervade her. In her midst, I can be glad with an entire gladness. He is constraint. She is freedom to me. He makes me wish for another world. She makes me content with this. Let's preserve this nature, this earth. Let's stay on the path we've headed down with the Paris Agreement and not deviate back to our old dependencies on non-renewable resources. And I really do have confidence that together we can avoid creating a world where geoengineering is our only course of action. Thank you.